please um, pray together and then we will um, get started. May I request somebody to lead us uh, in prayer and then we will start. Can somebody pray with the class, please? Holy Father, as we are gathered together this morning before you, Lord, to learn from you, open our hearts, Lord, to receive the things spoken through the servant, Father, that we may receive it from you and keep it and understand your scriptures rightfully and also do it and be a blessing in this world and be a blessing to others. Bless the pastor, Lord. Teach us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Uh, hope, you've, hope you've been having a, a good week. Um, so we, we're continuing now in our course on interpreting scripture. And um, last week, we just got started uh, talking about interpreting prophetic scripture, interpreting prophecy. Um, some things to keep in mind as we work with prophetic text or prophetic scriptures. Um, so in both the Old and the New Testament, uh, there are many passages that are prophetic in nature, that are speaking uh, of things to come. They are, they are foretelling of uh, things to come. Now, all of the Bible is prophetic in the sense that it's all inspired by God. But uh, we are talking specifically of uh, scripture that is speaking in advance of things that are going to happen. Uh, what are some things to keep in mind as we study, as we uh, try to understand and interpret our prophetic scripture? So we're going to pick up from where we paused last week. I'm going to share the PDF. All right. So <clears throat> what, the first thing we looked at is timeline. Um, what we said was that in prophetic text, sometimes in a single statement or even in a single paragraph, there could be portions of the text that refer to different timelines or periods in time when those scriptures would be fulfilled. Uh, one example we took was Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, where it says, you know, unto us uh, a child is born, unto us a, a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulder. So it's just one sentence um, that prophet Isaiah is spoke uh, and has written for us. Just one sentence. But in that sentence, there are two different time periods that are being referenced. And literally there's 2000 plus years in between. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. That is referring to the birth of Christ, which happened 2000 years ago. And the government will be on his shoulder. That means he's going to be in a place of authority, uh, uh, governing, ruling as a king on the earth. That's going to happen um, when he sets up his millennial kingdom on the earth physically. Uh, Revelation, the 20th chapter, uh, verses 4, 5, 6, talk about it. So it's one sentence, but there's a, a gap of about 2,000 years or so uh, in, in between those two things that he's prophesying about. So uh, we should be mindful of that. That's just one example. That in one sentence, there could be uh, a huge uh, time gap. Another, uh, there are many, many examples that we could pick up from Scripture. Uh, another example we looked at is in Isaiah 65. 
um, verses 17 to 24, uh, verse 17 talks about, I create a new heavens and the new earth. And then verse 20 to 24 is talking about life in the millennium. So verses 17 to 19, and then verses 20 to 24, it's one paragraph, but it's talking about two different time periods and the time periods are actually interchanged. 70 to 19 is talking about new heavens and a new earth. 20 to 24 is referring to the millennium and correctly, the millennium comes before new heavens and the new earth. How would we know that? Only when you read Revelation chapters 20, 21, 22. Then you know that, hey, the millennium comes first, then comes new heavens and the new earth. So therefore, although Isaiah in 60, chapter 65 is first speaking about new heavens, new earth, and then he goes back to speaking about millennium, we need to make that shift, you know, that, uh, okay, this comes first and then comes new heavens, new earth, based on uh, what we see elsewhere in the Bible. So these are just examples where, you know, uh, we have to be very careful in dealing with prophetic scriptures. And when we are interpreting prophecy, Bible prophecy, uh, uh, we need to look at the timeline we understand as we look at other portions of scripture that are speaking uh, about the same thing, right? So we have to look at the full picture and then we can, we will be uh, able to arrive at the correct timeline. Example, in the case of Christ, you know, when you come into the New Testament, then you realize, oh, Christ was born, but he's going to rule in an earthly kingdom much later. When he came the first time, he didn't set up an earthly kingdom, right? So only when you look into the New Testament will you understand Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 correctly. Right? So that has to do with timeline. So keep in mind, uh, a very important principle in interpreting Bible prophecy is look at it from the entirety of scripture. Now, of course, we do this for everything, but especially in Bible prophecy, if we want to get the timeline correct, we have to look at it from the entirety of scripture. You know, what are the other passages uh, about the same matter? Uh, what do they say? And then we will be able to arrive mm, uh, at a correct timeline. The second example we looked at, which, where, which is where we stopped, was about uh, prophetic imagery or uh, figurative language uh, that is used, you know, um, images or figures or symbols. Um, and very often in Bible prophecy, uh, there are all these strange images or figures that, are, that we read about. Uh, because somebody had, you know, uh, uh, Daniel would have seen it in a vision or in a dream, or John is seeing things uh, and, and God is revealing it to him um, using f figures and symbols. And, uh, 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 and many times when we read these uh, figures and symbols, it is very confusing. You know, what does this mean? But what we said last week was many times uh, when, when there are figures and images that are given in prophecy, many times you'll find that those um, figures and images are interpreted in the vicinity. That means in some close by, in, in as you continue reading, God will himself or give the meaning of uh, those images and uh, script, you know, things that are used. And, uh, that is one. And sometimes if you don't find the explanation within that same chapter or in the nearby scriptures, then you look at, okay, maybe somewhere else in the Bible, uh, that image is explained for us. And so we looked at Revelation 12, 1 to 6 as an example, where John saw a woman, the sun, the moon, the 12 stars, and he saw the woman who gave birth to a man child or a male child. And there was this dragon, a red dragon that had taken a third of the stars with him, you know? So obviously you're saying like, hey, what are all these images representing? You know, who is the woman? 
who is the male child, <coughs> sorry, who is this red dragon? And then what we pointed out from Revelation 12 is like, if you just read on in the scriptures, you will, in that passage, you'll find out right there in chapter 12, a little further down, it says, and the dragon, Satan, the sub old serpent, the serpent of old. So it's interpreted there for us, or it's explained for us right there that this red dragon is referring to the devil, Satan. So we shouldn't just say red dragon, or oh, that represents China, no. In the passage, chapter 12 itself, it's explaining to us that uh, the, red, the dragon is Satan. Then we say, okay, who's a male child? Well, the male child, again, it talks about the male child who will rule the nations with a rod of iron. And he was caught up to God. Oh, that, that speaks so much about Jesus. And then we know if Revelation 19, Jesus himself is referred to as the one who rules the nations with a rod of iron. So it's very clear. So both in the same chapter, and by cross-referencing other chapter, we can easily conclude the male child is talking about Jesus Christ. And he was the one who was caught up uh, 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 to the father. Then we say, okay, now who is the woman? You know, uh, because the woman gave birth to the male child. Well, that's one clue in the sense, who did Jesus come out of? Uh, he came out of the nation of Israel, one clue. But who is this woman? Then we see, okay, in Revelation 12, verse 1, he says, the woman, uh, there was the sun, the moon, the 12 stars. Who's the woman? Oh, when you go back um, uh, to the Old Testament, to um, to Genesis, and we, we see this in Genesis 37, where uh, when Joseph has his dream, he sees his father, his mother, uh, the sun, the moon, and the 11 stars. That means he sees the nation of Israel being represented by the sun, the moon, and the 12 stars. So we can conclude both by the fact that it was Jesus came out of the nation of Israel and by this comparison, the sun, the moon, the 12 stars, with the Old Testament, that the woman is referring to the nation of Israel. And then also, if you read on in chapter 12, it talks about the dragon persecuting the woman. Again, it becomes clear it's the nation of Israel. So when, when we read about these figures and symbols, uh, we try to interpret them just using the text, that, 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 that the, the, the information given in the text or in related scripture passages. Okay, let's, uh, let's look at one more example and then we will take any questions on, on that. Um, uh, if you go with me to Revelation chapter 17, uh, Revelation 17, and uh, if you look at uh, verses 1 and 15, and I want you to answer the question, what are the many waters? So Revelation chapter 17, verse 1 and 15, I'm going to look in the chat. What do the waters represent in Revelation 17, verse 1? Revelation 17, verse 1, you know, um, one of the angels is showing John a great harlot who is sitting on many waters. What are these waters? You can either speak it out or you can type it in the chat. Uh, but the question is, what do waters represent in Revelation 17, 1? You look at Revelation 17, 1 and also look at verse 15. What do waters represent? Nations. Mm -hmm. Yep. So the waters are representing, as it says in verse 15, yeah, Nicholson's, yeah, I see, your chair. I see the messenger. The waters represents peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages. 
So Revelation 17, 1, he sees this great harlot, uh, which is Mystery Babylon, the great harlot. Uh, we will explain, uh, you know, the, who the great harlot is. The great harlot represents a, a world religious system. But he sees this great harlot sitting on many waters. That means like on a on sea, you know, on an ocean. So the question was, what does the waters represent? And the answer is given to us in verse 15. The waters, the seas, the oceans, right? You have a picture of this big vast expanse of water. The water represents peoples, multitudes, nations, language, meaning the nations of the world, peoples of all the nations. So we learned something. In Bible typology or in prophetic typology, waters, seas, oceans represent, God uses that to represent nations, peoples, multitudes, you know, peoples of all nations. He uses that. So now we know water in the Bible can be used for many things. Or uh, eternal life, you know, is represented by water. Holy Spirit is represented by water. The Word of God is represented by water. Um, but here, when we see seas, uh, vast expanse of water, that represents in Bible typology. Uh, it represents nations, peoples, multitudes, languages. And it's explained for us right there in chapter 17, verse 15. So here's another example where a figure or a picture is given and the meaning of what is seen in the picture is explained in the chapter itself. Right? So we shouldn't go off and you know give it another meaning. No, no, no. The meaning is given right there in the chapter. Waters represents people's nations, languages, multitudes. It represents so that's what and this great harlot um you know represents a world religious system uh, which we can understand you know from reading the whole chapter 17 and also uh, when we see the sequence of events in Reve the book of revelation there is the false prophet who establishes a a world religious system that many people uh, subscribe to to worship the antichrist you know so that's the background of you know when you read through revelation you know what the great harlot represents so uh, the main thing is this, in interpreting Bible prophecy, when you're seeing this typology, uh, read along in the scripture and uh, uh, in the scripture itself, as you read along, uh, you will find many times, you'll find the meaning given to us. So we stay with that meaning. Don't give it some other meaning. You know, don't say, okay, you know, waters here the great harlot is sitting on the waters the waters represents the church uh, and uh, so there is a, a a big deception that is going to come on the church no don't do that you know don't don't go off and say the waters represent the church and that would be wrong because you know right here in revelation 17 15 it's telling us very clearly the waters represents um the multitudes the nations Okay, now, uh, the, the, so that's that's a very important. And like this, uh, when we study the book of Daniel, when we study Revelation, you know, coming up in in, in the future, in the in the, in your third year, we're going to study Revelation verse by verse and Daniel verse by verse. Uh, when we study that, uh, we will see a lot of uh, images being used, especially in Daniel. You know, but we shouldn't get uh, alarmed by those strange images because just read on, just read on. And in the text, those images, the meaning of those images are given. And we just stay with that. This is what the interpretation of those images mean. And that's how we study Bible prophecy. That's how we interpret Bible prophecy. And sometimes if the meaning of the images are not given in the adjoining text, then we look in the other parts of the Bible. What is that? What does that mean? And we interpret it based on related portions of scripture in other places in the Bible. 
The third aspect, um, any questions so far? Are you all with me? Yes, Pastor. Okay. All right, great. So the third aspect of uh, interpreting Bible prophecy, <laughs> sorry, which we must, uh, oh, uh, let me just share my screen, uh, share the PDF, which we must keep in mind, has to do with timing. Okay. So this again is a big, uh, big challenge, right? So you're reading something, uh, some prophet, you know, anyone in the Old Testament or New Testament is writing and saying this and this is going to happen. Then obviously our question is, okay, when is it going to happen? What is the timing, right? When is it going to, when will it happen? Now this is a big challenge because in many cases, many there is no year given, or oh, this will happen in the year 2022. There's nothing like that in the Bible. So, of course, we want to know the timing. When will it happen? You say it's going to happen. You're saying the day will come and it'll happen. Question is, when will it happen? Timing. Now, in some places, in prophecy, Bible prophecy, uh, the actual year years are given. Example, way back when God spoke to Abraham, God told very clearly, your descendants will be slaves in Egypt for 400 years. Very clear. Time is given, 400 years. Now, he didn't say which year to which year, but he said 400 years. So, okay, we understand 400 years. Or uh, when God spoke to Jeremiah uh, and even Isaiah, they prophesied very clearly. The, you, you will, the people of God, they, they will be captives in Babylon for 70 years. 70 years is very clear. 70 years. So, in some, situ in some places, the duration of prophecy is given. So when it's given as 70 years, we take it literally. 400 years is 400 literal years. You know, we don't say, oh, one day is a thousand years, a thousand years is one day. So uh, 400 years means 400 times thousand or whatever. We don't do those things, right? When it's given literally, we take it literally. Don't try to change it. Uh, if it says seven years, seven years. 70 years, 70 years. Like that. Now, sometimes God may talk about years figuratively. And that makes it quite difficult. You know, so if he tells you literally 40 years, 40 years is understandable. 400 years, 400 years is understandable. 70 years are 70 years. But if he's speaking about years figuratively, that is a little difficult. Okay. In some cases, even the figurative speaking may be easy to understand. Example, uh, you know, when uh, Potiphar had this dream, he saw seven fatted calves, uh, cows or calves coming. Then after that, he saw seven lean cows coming. And the lean cows ate up the fat cows. Okay. Now God gives Joseph the interpretation. And he says, now see how God is speaking, right? It's very strange. He's using cows. Uh, and each cow represents one year. It's kind of funny, but God is using figurative language. And fat cow means years of plenty, lean cows means years of famine. But God is giving the interpretation to Joseph. And in this uh, prophetic image, every cow represents one year. 
So that's pretty, okay, straightforward. There'll be seven years of plenty represented by each one of seven fat cows. There'll be seven years of famine represented by seven of seven, each of the slain cows. Okay, this is what is going to happen. Seven years of plenty, seven years of famine, understood. But in this case, very funnily or very interestingly, God is using cows to represent years. Where will you get that meaning? It is only the uh, uh, it is only God who gives that understanding, right? Hey, every cow represents one year, so it's a it's a, it's a revelation. It's an understanding God is giving, but He's using imagery. He's using uh, prophetic images uh, to communicate that message. Okay, but this is straightforward. This is okay. You you can understand it. But now, sometimes things get a little complicated. And one example of something quite difficult is in Daniel chapter 9. So uh, let's go and read it. Now, we will be studying Daniel chapter 9 and all that in detail, uh, you know, in our third year. But let's go and uh, look at Daniel 9 right now as an example where God is using figurative language to talk about time, but but uh, this 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 in interpretation is a little difficult. Okay, Daniel chapter nine. If you go with me, uh, and 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 let's read. Um, let's go here. Yeah, Daniel nine verses twenty four to twenty seven. Daniel nine twenty four to twenty seven. Can uh, somebody please read that for us? Daniel 9, 24 to 27. Somebody could read it. Sure. Um, 77s are decreed for your people and your holy city to finish transgression, to put, uh, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy place. Verse 25, know and understand this. From the time the word goes out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, the ruler comes, there will be seven sevens and 62 sevens. It will be rebuilt with streets and a trench, but in times of trouble. Verse 26, after the 62 sevens, the anointed one will be put to death and will have nothing. The people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end will look like a flood. War will continue until the end and desolations have been decreed. Verse 27, he will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. In the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. And at the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. Mm. So, this is this passage is one of the most accurate prophecies. You know, one of them. In Daniel, the book of Daniel is actually very amazing because, uh, and many many people even non-Christians are amazed at uh, the book of Daniel uh, in the way he uh, Daniel so correctly prophesied about coming world empires and also uh, accurate timing given. Uh, people were am amazed, book of Daniel. And this was one of the passages where the timing is so accurate but yet it is given to us in such a difficult language. The difficult, actually, it looks difficult, but once you understand it, it is plain and simple, right? So what is the difficulty? Now, if you look at, if you just follow with me in this passage in verse 24, he talks about 77s. Now, uh, for those of us who are using the King James or uh, 
uh, uh, New King James, it would be 70 weeks, right? Um, the word, the, the Hebrew word weeks can also be just simply tr translated sevens. So that's why some versions would have 70 sevens and some versions will have 70 weeks. A week just represents seven, seven days, right? So in, in verse 24, the angel Gabriel is speaking to Daniel and he's saying, Daniel, 70 sevens are determined for your people and your holy city. That means what I'm going to tell you has to do with 70 sevens with a time, a time period that is represented by 77s concerning you, concerning your people, that is the Jewish people, and Jerusalem, holy cities, Jerusalem. Now, we have to figure out what is 77s. Okay, 70 times 7 is 490. Now, 490 what? 490, is he talking about 490 days? Or is he talking about 490 years? It's, it's, it's of course, it's, it's, it has to do with time. So what is that? 70 sevens, which that mathematically 70 times seven is 490, we know. But um, what is he talking about? So we see, so this is where we have to, think and see, okay, is there anywhere else where seven is used in relation to time? Now, when we understand Old Testament scripture, we understand when we, uh, uh, we know that in the, their context, Bible times, Old Testament, this sevens or this week was used to represent years. Example would be, uh, if, you, if you look in Genesis 29, uh, when, uh, if you go, you just turn with me to Genesis 29, um, and you uh, look at, uh, you know, what happened between Laban and Jacob, uh, in Genesis 29, verse 27, can somebody read that, please? Genesis 29, verses 27 and 28. Genesis chapter 29, verses 27 and 28. Can somebody read it? 27. Fulfill her week, and we will give you this one also for the service which you will serve with me still another seven years. Then Jacob did so and fulfilled her week. So he gave him his daughter Rachel as wife also. Mm, thank you. So here's one example where it's the same word, week or seven, where it is used to represent a period of seven years. So Laban tells Jacob, fulfill her seven, fulfill her week. That means another seven years. Oh, now we see that in Bible times, in Old Testament scripture, this seven or this week was used to represent a period of seven years. Okay. So therefore, when you go back to Daniel 9, 24, 70 weeks or 77s, 490 years, because a week represents seven years. Okay, makes sense. And what's going to happen in 490 years? Well, he's saying in 490 years, there will be these two things happening two sets of things happening. In verse 24, there'll be end of transgression, make end of sins, make reconciliation for sin. So that means sin is going to be dealt with. Then everlasting righteousness will be brought in, 
vision and prophecy will be fulfilled and the most holy place will be anointed. Two sets of things he's talking about. 490 years. But then he breaks it down. He says in verse 25, no one understand from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. That means that there's a total of seven plus 62, which is 69 weeks. From the time to rebuild Jerusalem, that is King Cyrus gave the issue, order, go and rebuild Jerusalem. Until Messiah, until Jesus comes, there'll be 69 weeks. What is 69 weeks? 69 times 7, 483 years. And this was fulfilled exactly. Exactly. Right? From the time King Cyrus told the people, go and rebuild Jerusalem, to the time when Jesus came, 483 years was fulfilled. And this is what Angel Gabriel told Daniel. So he says, I've come to talk to you about 70 years, 70 sevens, which is 490 years. And in this period that I'm going to talk to you about, two things are going to happen. One is sin will be atoned for, sin will be dealt with. Secondly, the eternal righteousness will be ushered in and the most holy place will be anointed. Then he says, the four, first 483 years happens like this. From the time to go and rebuild Jerusalem till the Messiah comes will be 483 years. So timing, right? Timing is given, but timing is being given in a very difficult way in the sense, you know, he's talking about 77s. But once you understand what that seven means, or the weeks mean, then it begins to make sense. But in this passage, we have the same uh, timeline map issue that we had addressed earlier. Because after he talks about 483 years, he skips a lot of time and then he jumps to the last seven years. So he talked about totally 490 years. 483 plus 7. So 483 years from the time King Cyrus gives the issue to go and rebuild Jerusalem till Jesus Christ comes. He came. He made atonement for sin. He died. So it says then verse 26, after the 62 weeks, that is 62 plus 7. That's after 62 weeks, Messiah will be cut off. That is Messiah will be crucified and so on. And uh, the city will be destroyed. The saints will be destroyed, which happened. The temple was, the city of Jerusalem temple was destroyed right after that. Then verse 27, he's jumping 2,000 years almost. And he's going straight to the last seven years. The last seven years in Daniel 9, 27 is the seven years of tribulation. And we know that because... You know, he has already spoken of it earlier in, in Daniel chapter 7 and 8. And we read about it in, you know, uh, in, in Revelation chapter 11 and 12 and 13. You know, this, this this repeated in many places. So based on all that scripture, we know Daniel 9, 27 is talking about the last seven years of tribulation. And here in Daniel 9, 27, he says, then he... Now, this he is referring to the Antichrist, whom he has spoken of in Daniel chapter 7. So he says, he will confirm a covenant with many for one week. What is that one week? One week represents seven years. But in the middle of the week, that means 30, three and a half years, middle of the week, middle of seven years, three and a half years, he will stop the sacrifices. So... If you look at this passage, actually, the timing is very precise. 483 years, seven years, middle of the seven years, that is three and a half years. All these things are given in great detail. But he's using figurative language. He's talking about 70 weeks. And that, if you crack that, that means if you understand that, the rest of the timing given in this passage becomes very clear. And in fact, what was fulfilled, the 483 years, 
was exact, was precise. And that's what astounds people. How could somebody prophesy in such accuracy on what was going to happen? But it has been fulfilled. So what I wanted to get across is, um, in understanding timing in Bible prophecy, sometimes it's straightforward. You know, he, say, he says, 400 years, 70 years, this so many years. Okay, straight. It's given literally. Sometimes it's given figuratively. Uh, by that figuratively is also easy to understand in the sense of seven, you know, like we saw, seven cows, seven fat cows, seven lean cows. Okay, understand. Sometimes it takes a little bit of effort because like we saw here, when he talks about 70 weeks, so what is that? Then you understand from another place in scripture that a week represents seven years. Oh, he's talking about 490 years. Okay. Then everything else that you interpret in the remaining verses has to be, you know, translated like 62 plus seven uh, uh, makes 69 weeks, uh, 69 weeks, which is actually 483 years. And then uh, when he talks about one week, that actually represents seven years. Then everything makes sense. Is that okay? Uh, did you all understand it? Was it very complicated? Are you with me? Pastor, why it stated seven weeks and 62 weeks? The seven weeks represent the, the time for building of a temple in Jerusalem. Oh. Um, yeah, so he just he just breaks it down into seven plus sixty-two. Um, there is no specific thing we can say on why he broke it down into seven plus sixty-two. Yeah, there is no because when they when they went to rebuild the so when they went back to rebuild the city of Jerusalem and. Uh, um, um, you know, the walls of the city. This happened you know, during time of Ezra and Nehemiah. Uh, it didn't happen exactly like, you know, in uh, seven weeks, seven years. No, it actually, they did work and then they paused for, I think they paused, uh, they, they took, I think, about 13 years for it to be fully rebuilt, if I remember correctly. Uh, uh, so it doesn't have a correlation with at least to my knowledge, let me just look it up. Uh, it doesn't have a correlation to exactly when they uh, rebuilt the temple. Let me just look at Ezra. Ezra. Um, yeah, Ezra, I'm looking at Ezra. Mm. Three Ezra chapter three it talks about them laying the foundation for the temple. Yeah, Five thirty six <clears throat> BC, and um, no, it doesn't. Uh, it doesn't say that they just that they rebuilt it in seven years. Um, they they discontinued for some time, and then they started the work again, and. Uh, and the temple was rebuilt. And um, um, so the elders, they rebuilt it and they finished it in end of chapter six, Ezra six. Mm. Um, okay, so to answer your question, um, as far as I, I can tell, they, it doesn't match, like, you know, it doesn't match that seven years is the time they took to rebuild the temple, at least from what I know. So I, I, I wouldn't uh, stress on it. I would just say he just broke it down into seven plus 62. So we just added up 69 weeks, which is 483 years. Okay, thank you. So um, is this clear um, uh, when you talk about timing? Um, 
that uh, yeah we we sometimes it's pretty straightforward sometimes it's a little you know we have to really put in a little effort to understand it but it is understandable I mean, you can't figure it out you can understand it and when you understand it it's quite amazing wow you know the number of years that were spoken were very precise uh, pastor in verse 26 uh, end of it mm -hmm. the end of it shall be with a flood um, so is this also figurative or um, you know, we know that there would be a war towards the end. I think it is also mentioned in the next verse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the flood here, does it mean war or could be a natural flood as well? Yeah. So he talks about, you know, the, the, prince of, uh, the people of the prince will come who will destroy the city and the sanctuary. That, so that happened in AD 70. Okay? Um, uh, so the sanctuary was destroyed. Um, uh, this was uh, the Roman Emperor Titus who destroyed the city and the sanctuary that was fulfilled right after Jesus was crucified. Uh, AD 70, Jerusalem and the temple was destroyed. Then he says, the end of it will be with a flood until the end uh, the war and desolations are determined. So uh, we know that there was no um, flood in the sense of how water flood destroying the city of Jerusalem. So we would just say that from uh, the destroying of the sanctuary till the end, desolations are determined and uh, this flood would be figurative of problems and troubles and trials. Uh, that are from, from the time, that is AD 70, up until the tribulation, the city of Jerusalem, the people and the city of Jerusalem are going to continuously face a lot of difficulty and desolations and wars, which is true. Right? It's still going on. So the flood there will not be a literal flood, but more of representing troubles and difficulties and things that are going to continue till the beginning of the tribulation. Okay, so yeah. Sure. Okay, so uh, that, that has to do with timing. So we just saw, okay, so three things when you're studying Bible prophecy. We talk about timeline. We talk about interpreting the, fig, the, the images that we are seeing. And thirdly, we talk about trying to understand timing, right? Now, um, I just want to say one thing and then we'll go for a break. When... We don't know the timing for sure. We should avoid trying to make uh, our own predictions. For example, Jesus said, you know, uh, the hour in which he is going to come, nobody knows. Right? We can have, uh, we can look at the signs of the times and say, okay, this is when Jesus is going to come, uh, or getting close to when he's going to come. But we shouldn't try to put time or dates to it, right? Just leave that to God, right? So we shouldn't say, oh, Jesus is coming in the year 2027. No, we shouldn't do those kinds of things because he clearly said of that day, you know, of that hour, no one knows. You know, nobody can precisely say when Christ is going to come. So when, when, when God says, don't worry about it, don't worry about it, just Understand the signs of the times. That means we're getting close. We're getting close. We're getting close. But let's not try to put a, a day and a time. Two things that God said. Don't do not do that. Okay. So what we'll do now is we'll take a quick break. And then we'll come back and just go through some other guidelines here on um, how we work with Bible prophecy. Uh, we'll finish that. And then uh, uh, we'll see if we can get into the next chapter, which is... Uh, uh, Old Testament and New Testament, how the Old Testament is quoted in the New Testament and uh, how we should handle it uh, when we see uh, those quotations and references to the Old Testament in the New Testament. Okay, so we'll take a quick break and we'll be back in 10 minutes. Thank you. <laughs> 